All right, so um, let's just move on quickly to round two. Um, we are going to have a bunch of people come up and try and present talks for as long as they can. And uh, the audience is obviously encouraged to ask questions. Um, uh, so we'll start with Mihai, who's going to talk a little bit about P4, which is a new uh, pipeline modeling language that uh, is gaining a, a fair amount of momentum. So Mihai. Yes, you can reset it all up. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Mihai Budil. I uh, happen to work for a company called Barefoot Networks. But today, I uh, represent the P4.org consortium, which is uh, taking care of this uh, P4 language. And uh, you should think of me as a messenger from the future, ho hopefully. I I'm trying uh, to predict how uh, switches will evolve. So just a little bit about the P4 uh, consortium. There's a web page at p4.org. It says it's open for, to anyone for participations with no restrictions. Right now, it doesn't have too much. There's a, yeah, there's a language specification that you can download, but we promise that we'll release uh, the software um, and, uh, at the end of March. And actually, I have a demo for you. I don't know if I have enough time to give you the demo, because I need first to explain what the demo is about. And this is the first part of the presentation is about an explanation. So uh, what do we really want to achieve? So take a switch today, like the blue box on top. What we would like to do is for the switch to run you know, standard protocols, you know, like IP, uh, Ethernet, uh, you know, VLAN, whatever you want. But we'd also like you to enable to run your own protocols without asking permission from anyone. Why would you do that? Well, uh, there's many reasons. But uh, it turns out that um, it's most useful if you have a big playground where you can deploy your own network, like uh, your own data center. And today in the internet, there's a lot of machines in data centers. And uh, this is going to be very useful for this case. So uh, why would you write your own protocols? And uh, um, well, one reason is actually it's not that hard. So for example, we implemented uh, some protocols out there. VXLAN took 175 lines of code on the data plane. And then VGR is 183 lines of code. So you don't have to wait for the standards body to approve those protocols. You can just go ahead and, you know, if you find a bug in these protocols, you can fix it and deploy it without asking anyone. And uh, this P4 language has been designed to be very low overhead. So we really want it to work at terabit per second switching speeds. And uh, it should enable very flexible forwarding policies because you are not bound to the existing protocols. You can write really any protocol you'd like. And uh, it should provide you the ability to write additional stuff that you cannot do in switches today. And if I get to run the demo, I'll show you some very, very simple bu building blocks that you could use to build your own, um, for example, signaling. All right, well, <laughs> monitoring and troubleshooting. And you know, you can just upgrade your switch us using software and it will do something new. And maybe, you know, some people care about this one. You don't need to deploy all the protocols that are out there. You might deploy only what you need and you might only pay for what you need. All right, so let me explain how it works. So uh, at the highest level of view of a switch today is like this. There's a control plane, which is quite complicated, and we're not going to address that at all. And there's a data plane, which should be really fast. I'm talking especially about custom hardware switches. And these two, they have uh, an API. The control plane tends to uh, control the data plane behavior using table management. Think of routing tables, right? By writing entries in, writing entries in the routing table, you tell the data plane what to do. But there's also some control traffic. Whenever the data plane doesn't know what to do, it bumps packets up to the control plane and the other way around. And all these blue arrows are packets in my picture. So the, the view of the world that we'd like to achieve is the one at the bottom, in which you have a control plane. This hasn't changed. We're not going to help you with that too much. But you don't have a data plane, right? There's no data plane. Your switch is empty. It's a blank uh, piece of paper. Now what you do is you have a P4 program that your control plane downloads. You write the program, and through the control plane, you download into the switch, and then the switch suddenly has a data plane. And your P4 program specifies your data plane. And the switch does exactly what your program tells it to do, and nothing more. And then, uh, so we have this additional API, the P4 program. And also, if you think about it, since the tables are not fixed, you know, maybe we don't even have IP, maybe we have an our own protocol. The set of tables that you use to control the data plane will have to change. It's program dependent. So I keep talking about data planes. 
The question is which data planes? And if the language is designed right, it shouldn't matter. This should work for all data planes. If you have a programmable ASIC, it should work, but it could be also an FPGA switch, and it would make a lot of sense. But it, it can be just a programmable network card, and it could be a software switch, or maybe you, know, you can come up with something new. So that's the goal. It's a very ambitious goal. Is it even possible? Well, I think we have some proof that it's possible. So let me tell you how it works briefly. So let's focus on the data plane. So I just blow up the pink box on the bottom, which is the data plane. And the way we think about the data plane is like this. You know, packets come to the left, they, they go out to the right. And the data plane is really a fixed function device. But it turns out that you can generalize some of the functions of the, the fixed function device. And all these blue boxes that we know how to generalize, we move into P4. So we still have fixed function devices, but we try to shrink them as much as possible. We don't know yet all of P4. P4 is a language in evolution. If we understand how the pink uh, uh, part of the switch functions, we should be able to gobble more and more of it. But we still allow you to have fixed fun function because this language is not powerful enough. All right, let me focus now on the blue boxes. So what's the core idea? What does the switch do? Well, at the input, what you get is a packet, which is nothing but a byte array. So then you go through a programmable parser. So what does the parser do? It identifies parts of your packet. Just it looks at bits, bit patterns, and then says, you know, this is an Ethernet header, a VLAN header, and so on. And whatever you don't care about is a payload. All right? Pretty obvious. Next, what you go through is a set of programmable match, ac match action units. What these do basically is just, just manipulate structures. Think of big structs with metadata describing what you want to do to your packet. Look up routes, look up ports, you know, decide what else you want to stuff in. But it's just bit manipulation, all right? You look up bits, you create new bits, and then you collect everything you want to do together. Now comes a part with, we, we're not going to address, which is the queuing and real, the real switching where you move the packets. This is still fixed function in P4 today. But once you know what you're going to do to your packet, you have the, uh, the headers that you want to emit at the output, and then you have a programmable reassembly engine which puts up together the byte array that you send on the output port. And that's it. There's not much to it, right? It's pretty simple. So I'm going to take all these three blue boxes, and I'll tell you a little bit about each of them. It turns out that each of them has its own mini language. And the language is actually very, very simple. So the programmable parser is really a state machine-based parser. And I'll give you an example right away. And it, the main operation it does is bit field extraction. You just advance the pointers to the packet and extract bit, bits out of it. Um, now, the second part of the switch is a programmable match action unit. And the core primitive used there is a table lookup and table updates. You also do, obviously, bit field manipulation. And we also give some control flow, very restricted forms of control flow. Um, which, so you can make decisions based on the outcome of your lookups. And finable, finally, the programmable reassembly is very simple. It just puts bits together. So this language is very, very, very simple. It doesn't have any notion of pointers, for example. There's no pointers. There's no memory. There's no indirect addressing. It doesn't have any notion of loops. And it doesn't have any notion of recursion. Depending on uh, one of the fields, decide which other parser you, come, uh, you, you call. All right? So it has states and transitions. And uh, if you draw a picture, uh, that's, for example, uh, a fragment of a state machine parser for a small set of protocols. Very, very simple. All right, let's move on to the next box, the match action unit. The match action unit is based on tables. And uh, each table reads some fields that you have uh, looked up in your packet or maybe that you have computed and also decides what action to perform. So for example, this is a table which has two columns. The first one is the key that you use to look up. And you don't have to look up with the exact key. For example, this is an LPM type match, which means you know, longest prefix match. And then for each key that you use to look up, you have an action. And I'm going to tell you in a second what the actions are. Pretty clear so far, I hope, right? Now, the actions, the, if you could think of them as, ac as uh, function pointers. So for each entry, you have a pointer to that little function. For example, in this table, I have only two actions, the drop action and the set next hop action. And this is the way you would write the body of this set next hop action. You don't have to really read all of this. What it does, it looks up the uh, IP address of the destination. And then based on that, it extracts the ad address of the next hop and the port that you have to forward the packet to. This is really a routing table. And, but you see also the action also decrements the TTL field of the, of the packet. Technically, it should also perhaps, uh, if the TTL is zero, it should drop the packet, but I try to keep it simple. All right, so this is the, the ingredient, uh, the main ingredient in the match action unit. Another ingredient you need is control flow. And this is an example program. It's only fit for control flow, only if conditionals. 
And based on the decisions and the data you've collected so far, you can decide what else you want to do with your packet. It's uh, pretty simple. And finally, reassembly is even simpler than all of this together. Essentially, you can add headers, headers being other structures with declared types. You can declare headers or remove headers from your packet. And at the end, they will be collapsed into a byte array, and that's what you get on the wire. All right, that's, that's P4 in a nutshell. So one other thing that you should realize you get out of P4, not only you get a data plane, but one thing which is very important, you get the tables. When you write your program, you, you describe your program in terms of looking up stuff in tables. So what you need is a new API which allows the control plane to manage these tables. The control plane you have to write in a programming language of your choice. We don't give you any help there. But what we can generate is the, uh, the API th to manage the table contents from the, the control plane. So this is, the, this is dependent on your program. So this is a very weird mindset if you think about it. Unlike a s traditional switch in which you know your protocols and you know what like, you're going to look up, here you don't, everything is uh, unknown. Maybe there's not even IP. All right, so let me summarize P4. So it's a very simple language, and it has to be simple because it has to be fast. It's based on parsing, which is based on state machines, bit field manipulation, table lookups, control flow, feed forward control flow only, and packet reassembly. And we really target very high, high uh, speed uh, execution. Ideally, this should work at terabit speeds. There's no reason this shouldn't work at terabit speeds. And one thing which is very important for this language is there's no virtualization in the language, really. We virtualize resources, but the goal is to have a very simple cost model. When you execute an instruction in this language, it should be fairly clear what is going to happen. This is what actually enables very high speed. And actually, it ties a lot to the discussion you had previously about what happens if hardware doesn't have enough resources. So this language doesn't help you with that. Oh, all right. And uh, hopefully, the language is, will be, is portable. It's not tied to any architecture or any capabilities. And it should be expressive. Actually, you can write all the existing protocols we've tried and the new protocols and forwarding policies. And you can also write very weird stuff in the network plane and the data plane, which allows you to do monitoring and instrumentation of your data plane. All right. So if I want you to remember one slide about what P4 is, it's this one. So if you take a switch today, it has the control plane and it has the data plane. And it's a kind of a closed ecosystem, right? Now, what we want to do is we want to an, an API, but it's a special API. It's a programming language interface. It's a PLI, right? We want to allow you to, ena to enable you to program the data plane. This is an interface which doesn't exist in today's switches. And it's great. I think it's a great thing when, when you can create an interface like this, a very rich and expressive interface in a place where there wasn't such an interface. Because suddenly, you can start to do things that were impossible before. So that's the reason for P4. All right, so that's my uh, last slide in the presentation. And I, I have a demo which I could uh, try to run. Um, um, do I have time? All right, well, I try to speak fast. So, so you're welcome to interrupt me, but I still try to speak fast. Yeah, question? Yeah, uh, do I or they can talk from here? Um, you should conditionals with, you said there was, you can do if statements. That's it. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's the problem with loops again? You said you don't have loops, or well, the pr the problem with loops is you cannot predict how long they will take to execute. Uh, but loops are exited by some conditional somewhere, right? Well, the the, the language today doesn't have loops, and the w it's rich enough. You, you can synthesize loops in several ways if you really want loops. So one thing th that you, if you look at the data plane. Uh, we allow you to have fixed functions in the data plane. These functions can actually create loops. So for example, your hardware is allowed to take a packet from the output port and put it back to the input port if you want. And you can so control that from P4. But P4 itself doesn't allow you to write any loops. That's one way you can do it. All right, so the second question is, is everything a table, or could you have structures, scalars? Oh, so the, the, about the data types. The question is about the data types in the language. Right. So the data types are arbitrary structures, uh, ar ar arbitrarily nested. And tables, they are also uh, mapping structures to structures. So the keys in the table can be structures. The values in the tables can be structures. Actually, they are actions. You could, should think of them as pointers to objects. And the objects can have uh, also payload, like uh, additional structures inside. I don't know if I follow that. But OK. I'll so let me show you an example. Maybe it will become clearer. Well, 
I can take a quick question. Okay. Um, so my question is, if you go back uh, to the slide that showed um, headers, you had a, a white box for the payload. And That's I'm wondering, for those protocols that actually want to do something with the payload, say a CRC, um, I imagine you might want to get into some crypto or check some. Is there facilities in P4 to do sort of uh, byte processing across a whole packet? Okay, so the question is, what happens to the payload? Sometimes you want to touch the payload. So P4 has some facilities for checksumming, but uh, it doesn't do much for crypto and uh, stuff like that. S so right now, it's out of the scope of the language. Uh, and the reason is that uh, I think once you put something in a language and the language gets adopted, you can never take it out. So I say, let's get more experience about how people use this. And if it, we know how to generalize it and it works uh, across all the platforms, I, I, it should be in the language. Okay, and w one other quick question. So I think you mentioned it was loop-free. Is that correct? That's correct. How would you handle um, a protocol that has TLV? Say I, w I wanted to look at options in the IP header. Oh, so, so if you care about options in the IP header, it turns out that the state machine in the parser can have loops. So there's a, so for example, uh, if you look at the state machine I drew here, th there's, a, there's a loop uh, between a VLAN state and itself. So this allows you to parse uh, uh, packets which might have a, an unknown size or an unknown number of fields statically. But that's a very limited uh, form of uh, looping because you always should make progress. And uh, for every loop iteration, you should consume some bits. So this should terminate eventually. Make sense? All right. All right, so what I'm gonna show you is uh, based on this slide. Uh, so, so this is the setup. I'm using Mininet, which is actually a pretty cool uh, tool, uh, which allows you to run a whole network on your laptop. So it does this using virtual machines. So my Mininet network will have uh, one switch, which is the pink box, and will have um, uh, two hosts, H1 and H2, which will be created on my uh, laptop. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a P4 program. Actually, I already wrote it. I'm not gonna type it now. It, it has 170 lines. Actually, you see the title of the talk is writing a basic L2, L3 switch with 170 lines of code. And uh, I'm gonna compile that program. So let me start right now. Uh, this actually runs on, um, on a, in a virtual machine. Just a second, my display, okay. So I'm gonna start the compilation here. It's a little more complicated than it should be. It's building all sorts of modules. And I have two X terms here. The the bottom one should be pink. It looks white from this angle. And it, it will represent my data plane. And the green one is the control plane. Uh, that's why it sits on top. Uh, so I'm gonna run some comments there. All right, so my switch is built now. So what I've done is I've, uh, I've uh, compiled the P4 program and I've generated the switch. So uh, let me tell you what's in this switch. This switch actually has three tables. So this is actually pretty nice because it, it deconstructs the way you do um, IP forwarding. So it's, it's pretty neat, I think, the fact that you really have to go through all the steps. So the first table actually looks up, based on your destination IP address, looks up your next hop at IP address, the output port, and decrements the TTL. Actually, it's the table you've seen in the example in the previous slide. The next, you go through a table which uh, is based on the next hop IP address, and this looks up the Ethernet address of the next host that you're gonna put in your packet. And finally, the last table is based on the output port you compute in the first table and has to rewrite the IP, the uh, Ethernet address of your outgoing packet to, the, to be the local port address. So you really have to write all down all this gruesome stuff. But uh, you write only what you need. So this switch doesn't do anything else except what I told it to do. So it's a very, very slim switch. And you know, the code looks like this. For example, this is the, the, the header declarations. Uh, you've seen this already. There's also an IPv4 header declaration. This switch doesn't do IPv4 options, just to keep it simple. Then this is the parser. There's a parser which parses Ethernet and looks at the Ethernet type, and if it's uh, the IP type, it dispatches to the other parser for IPv4, which I'm not showing either here. But since it's, there's no options, it's actually pretty basic. I want to point out that you can also declare checksums, so there's a way to, to say that you want checksums uh, computed on the IPv4 header. And uh, checksums are computed both at the ingress and at the egress. Uh, at the ingress, you check them, at the egress, you generate them. Now this is the last table in the, the switch. I'm just showing you the whole code. Remember this table looks up the port and uh, based on the port, it rewrites the MAC address of your uh, outgoing packet. 
And this is the action. It's pretty simple. It rewrites the source address of your packet, and then uh, you use the egress port to look up the table. So you, know, you, you, you can declare the sizes. This is about the resources. Uh, you have to hint the size to the, the system. And finally, this is the complete pipeline. It's a very simple pipeline. The whole switch has uh, the actually two little pipelines inside, the ingress and the egress, and it just changes. There's no conditional here. It just flow the packet through all of these. All right, so let me show you how now how it works. So let's uh, move out of this, uh, into these uh, switches. So, uh, so here I'm starting uh, uh, Mininet. The Mininet is this tool I told you that runs a virtual machine on your, uh, can you see the fonts? Yes. All right, so I have, I, now I started the switch. The switch is running, uh, the hosts are connected to the switch and I can, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, start uh, something running on one of the switches, on the, one of the hosts. This is the, the H1 host. I'm going to see what happens in, uh, in that host. So I'm going to try to do a ping from host 1 to host 2. And you can, see, you can see the ICMP packets getting out of H1, but there's no ping reply. So something wrong with my network? Well, uh, remember, I haven't populated the tables. All my tables are empty, so that's why no packet is being forwarded. The switch doesn't do anything to those packets. Actually, it drops them somewhere in the middle of the pipeline. So now what we have to do is we have to fill the tables. And I prepared here uh, some uh, uh, data to fill the tables. So there's a, there's a switch control script. And then I'm going to run the commands. The commands, there's actually six commands which uh, correspond to the three tables. First two populate the first table, the second one, the third one. And now we can try to, uh, to ping. Let me just filter this to ICMP. Actually, uh. ah. all right. Uh, doesn't matter too much. Okay, so now I can ping, and the packets come back. Yeah, the window is too large. Uh. Anyway, all right. So now it's working. So I have a switch which is working. And I built it in 170 lines of code. So, uh, so you can do other stuff with the switch. I showed you how to populate the tables. And then you can also keep state in the data path. There's a notion the tables don't have to be read only. They can be read write. And it turns out, actually, when I wrote my program, I already set up some counters. For example, this is a statement which attaches counters to each entry of a table. So uh, it's a little baroque. But essentially what it says, this is the table name. And this is the, the, the last table in the, the pipeline. And it says direct means for each entry in the table, you should keep a counter. And actually, I can dump these counters. I have a script which uh, does that, too. Um, say counters, I think. So for example, this one dumps the first row on the table. And now we have 882 uh, bytes have flown through the table. So this counter keep, uh, counts bytes, but you can count packets as well. And if, if I let packets continue flowing, you can see how the counter keeps getting incremented. So the, the data plane maintains the counter, and the control plane retrieves these counters from the data plane through the table access APIs. All right. And then one last thing I want to show you, it's about the flexibility of the, of the language and how, what you can do when you can build a switch that uh, doesn't look like any other switch people have built. So what I'm going to do uh, something you might find brain dead. And that actually is brain dead. Well, you wouldn't do this in a real switch. But the fact you can do it is actually what's amazing. So I'm going to inject another table in the flow. The first table will just look up the destination address of the packet. And if it matches in the table, it will be rewritten to some other destination address. All right? This is the whole code I had to in inject. Actually, I, I apply another table in front of the whole flow. And the whole table is described here. You just look up with the destination IP address. And if it matches, you replace it with whatever you find in the table. So uh, OK, let's start the ping again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divert packets that go to host 2 to go back to host 1. So that's, uh, that's something you shouldn't do normally. But you can do it. So, so now if you look at the, the, the ICMP packets in uh, the, the request and the reply, well, I, my screen resolution has changed when I uh, connected the projector. So, so the request is both sent and received at the same uh, host. 
So you can have a, the switch reflect the packet back. But imagine what you could do when you have this degree of control. So that's the, that's the point. All right, that's, that's the whole demo I have. So uh, I, let me conclude. So uh, the code that you've seen in action, we, will, uh, we promise to release it all uh, with a very liberal uh, free and open source license before the end of March. And uh, 2015. 2015. <laughs> the, the year is there. And uh, we think that there's many reasons to build switches this way. It will uh, unleash a wave of, of possibilities. And uh, I think it's a very exciting time to be working in this area. Thank you. So I got a quick question, maybe? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Yeah, we have time for questions. Quick question? OK. Um, so Mininet, I've, I've usually seen it run over like OBS. I know it can really run over th other things. But what's your, uh, what's your data plan here? Do you have your own that you've written? Um, OK, so, so the question is, what am I running in my demo? So I indeed, Mininet was written mostly to do uh, open switch, op open flow kind of uh, demonstrations. Yeah. There's no controller. There's no open flow controller. And the switch I'm running, the data plane, is entirely generated from the P4 program. Even the, is, OK, so you generate uh, C code and then compile C code? That's correct. Uh, okay. So, so we ju this is a behavioral model of your switch. So we generate yeah. a C program. The program is compiled. This uh, router control is actually a Python program, which does RPCs using thrift to mm -hmm. the C program running uh, in, on the same machine. OK, great. And this is a, this is a barefoot uh, software? So as I said, I'm a I work for barefoot, but I represent P4.org. Barefoot will release this software, indeed. OK, the, the, and data and the question is that the data plane emulator, will that be part of what is released? Or is it only the P4 compiler? Is that your question, John? So, so, so uh, yeah, that's it. I just know there's a few of these kind of projects running around. I was just curious which one it was. So, so this is no, p th th there's no switch really to model. This, the switch that you get out of is uh, the, the program is whatever you write. So this generates a program which essentially runs the, these tables that you've written. It's very simple. Other questions? I had a question. So um, this is a great pipeline, works great. Everything looks OK. If I want to do stateful ECMP, some traffic distribution thing, so something that needs to know about all the pipelines that are running through my system and their statistical flow what, or statistical distribution, what would that mean? So the question is about stateful processing. So, um, well, I have two answers to that. So, so one thing is I've, I've already shown you that you can keep state in the pipeline using counters, but the way you can manipulate that state is uh, fairly limited. And uh, for that, I, I don't know if there's a universal solution. If you want to do it at speed, uh, so what you can always do in this model, as in traditional switches, is bump it up to the control plane. So we still have the same channels that existed before, where you can pass packets and uh, messages to the control plane. In addition, the control plane can read and write the tables. So there's another communication channel that you have. But I don't think there's a simple solution to a universal question like that. Any more? Going once, gone. Thank you. I'll be around mm -hmm. this evening if you want to talk. Thank you.